Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. This episode of the House of Mystery is brought to you by Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. LegacyFoodStorage.com Fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCB, 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and today we are covering Jack the Ripper again. <laughs> We've had several shows on that, and of course our resident expert, uh, Michael Hawley, is all pumped up and ready. Oh yeah, I'm excited, especially for this interview. These guys, these guys are great. Well, there we go. Um, so uh, let's get this going. So now the book we're talking about is The Escape of Jack the Ripper, the truth about the cover-up and his flight from justice. Now, the authors are our guests all the way from Australia. We've got Jonathan Hainsworth and Christine Ward Ages. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, uh, now, before we get into your, your book and your subject, so for the two of you, um, maybe give the listeners uh, some history on yourselves. How did you guys get um, caught up in, in this uh, Jack the Ripper case? Uh, well, like Michael, I'm a high school teacher. My subject is uh, history, and uh, I, I have a number of years of experience. And about a decade ago, I was teaching um, senior students about um, the history of England and um, 19th century London and British imperialism and colonialism, and that's a lot of isms. And so I thought that I might just do a lesson where I would lead in with the Jack the Ripper murders, just just open with true crime, because most people are interested in true crime. We are and you are and, and they are. And um, what happened was that in showing them some material about um, the suspects, a student noticed a discrepancy in one of the primary sources, one of the sources from uh, the late 19th century that I hadn't noticed. And she asked me to explain the discrepancy. And I couldn't because I, I just hadn't thought of it. But the discrepancy was is that a, a police chief called Sir Melville McNaughton, who we think was hands-on and knew everything, uh, he's been, we think, uh, misinterpreted in a number of secondary sources, a number of books on this case, uh, as someone who uh, did not know about his uh, three suspects he chose and certainly didn't know the true data about the person that he thought was the most promising suspect, uh, MJ Druitt. And, uh, and I accepted that because uh, for the simple reason that Mr Druitt was a young lawyer and McNaughton had described him in an in a me internal memorandum in Scotland Yard um, as doctor. And this seemed to show that the police were clueless and, uh, and couldn't even get the most basic facts right. But the student pointed out that what McNaughton had actually written uh, in one version of the memorandum was said to be a doctor. And that therefore this is a bit cagey, provisional. Like it, she said, doesn't that mean he might be a doctor. And I said, oh, I suppose so. And she replied, well, in that case, couldn't it mean he might not be a doctor? And he isn't a doctor. 
And I thought, well, yeah, that's a fair point. And so I went to a couple of books I had to just see how they explained it. And from what I could tell, no one had ever noticed. No one had ever picked up on the ambiguity of that statement. And uh, that began my journey in the writing of now two books on this case explaining uh, our interpretation of of that ambiguity and what lies behind it. And Christine um, is my partner and and uh, a retired public servant and, uh, and an artist, and she came aboard as a researcher for the first book and is now the co-writer of the second book. But she remains the preeminent researcher because I've found almost nothing. Um, and, and she has found um, stuff that no one has ever found before that we argue backs up our interpretation and theory of the subject. Um, I think like a lot of people all around the world, I had heard of the Jack the Ripper murders and um, I, I was interested in it but didn't know very much about them. Um, my work for the Australian government was mainly um, focused on a program to help single parents and um, to provide education and training so they could get back into the workforce. So working with people in that situation, I, I really learned a lot about, uh, you know, the way people live and the hardships. So working with, with people in that situation... I was interested in the women of Whitechapel and the way that families were living down there. So I think that's what initially drew me into looking at this um, true crime. And then Jonathan asked me to have a look at um, have a look at Melville McNaughton and and just see who he knew and see if we could find any connection to the Druitt family. So I think that's what set me off as far as a researcher on these two books. The title refers to a police dragnet that was closing in on, we think, uh, an English patient who had been put in a French asylum by the man's relations, and that this attempt to get him out of the way um, didn't work, it backfired, and they had to extract him from that asylum and bring him back to London. And the police were looking for that patient, but they didn't have his real name. And as this net closed around um, the person we think was the patient, Montague Druitt, um, he decided that he would uh, he would commit suicide rather than his family uh, be ruined uh, by connection to him and the terrible crimes he committed, and. Um, and as opposed to being arrested and hung, or as opposed to being perhaps uh, incarcerated permanently in in, a, in an asylum. So his escape was the escape from that dragnet, but also it's a polite way of saying he escaped earthly justice by drowning himself in the Thames. So, so Jonathan, uh, the when we look at the Jack Tripper murders, could you just kind of give us a little background of the, the Whitechapel murders and connecting with... McNaughton and also withdrew it? The, the Whitechapel murders begin in about the middle of uh, 1888 with two separate women driven by poverty into selling themselves on the street. And these two women were uh, murdered by separate gangs. That's probably the best theory. One of them had survived long enough to describe being attacked by a gang. And, um, they, they, their deaths caused an about face in the British press. Up until that time, 
the the attitude of the so-called better classes and as was expressed in the tabloid media was that women who were prostitutes in the impoverished East End, particularly in the worst slum of the worst slum, Whitechapel, um, they were moral failures or sex fiends. Um, they were responsible for their own uh, degradation. And then with those two murders, a month or so apart, the, the press now begin to say, well, their deaths were, were terrible and tragic, but so were their lives because they were really ground down by social neglect. And from that moment on begins the five murders by a singular uh, maniac or assassin um, who brings terror to the whole of London. But in fact, he is still only butchering um, so-called fallen women um, in, in the Whitechapel Spitalfields area, area, sorry, the, the worst slum of them all. And this climaxes with uh, two women being dispatched on the same night that uh, the East End is crawling with police trying to catch him. And then the further um, hideous climax is that the youngest of this person's victims, Mary Jane Kelly, is killed not in the street and left out there with her uh, organs and innards lying in the gutter. This time she's, she's strangled and then, and then we think, and then torn to pieces in her one room hovel, uh, which managed to ruin, uh, Lord Mayor's Day in the early hours of the next day when her, when, when her uh, remains are discovered. Uh, the photos of that uh, remain uh, uh, shocking today as they do then. Now, the, 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 the myth that McNaughton will create about uh, the, the case is that these five murders are the only murders. It's an autumn of terror. And the police knew at the time that whoever did that to Mary Jane Kelly could not survive, could not be compass or functional after such an explosion of horror. And therefore, he would have to have taken his own life or be put into a mental institution uh, for the rest of his life. In fact, what really happened was that the perception of the public and the press and the police was that the, the Jack the Ripper, whose, na whose name was coined by a couple of journalists um, who, who wanted to increase sales with, with a hoax letter to the police, um, yes. the, the, Jack the Ripper takes, takes a uh, hiatus and then comes back the following um, late 1889 and another um, uh, unfortunate, as they're also called, unfortunate woman, is also dispatched. And then there are other um, murders at that time or the, the remains found of a woman in Pynchon Street. And this is also linked to this singular maniac. And then it finally has its uh, climax um, where the whole thing comes to an end in February of 1891 with the death of another young woman driven into selling herself on the street due to poverty, a woman called Frances Coles. Now, she's not mutilated, but it's because of Bobby seems to have disturbed um, her murderer and he took off and her throat had been cut, but nothing else had been done. And a man was arrested, a sailor called Tom Sadler, and it appeared as if the it was going to end with the murderer caught and getting his um, just desserts. But in fact, it's another disaster for the police because the the main chief witness of the whole thing, an immigrant, uh, uh, a Hebrew immigrant from Poland named uh, Joseph Lavender, could not affirm that this was the man he had seen with the victim, Catherine Eddowes. And uh, the whole case against Tom Sadler collapsed. Um, and so he was released uh, and actually managed to sue a couple of newspapers successfully for suggesting he was Jack the Ripper. So really... The, the, the murders in Whitechapel are a protracted affair that lasts uh, over two years. And in the end, hundreds of men were arrested. Uh, obviously, Dr. Francis Tumblety is very prominent there. And none of them were charged with being Jack the Ripper. The, the central argument of our book is that from 
from 1898. The public are now informed that far from there being no good suspects, there was, in fact, three good suspects, and the chief amongst them was a middle-aged English Gentile surgeon whom the police were zeroing in on, but he drowned himself in the River Thames. And this caused a sensation when it appeared, just as a paragraph in the introduction of Major Arthur Griffith's book, Mysteries of Police and Crime, published at the end of 1898, um, because this was something that was seemingly unknown uh, to, 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 to reporters who had worked closely with the police. Now, Christine discovered that, in fact, George Sims, who was a close friend of Sir Melvin McNaughton, the police chief, and who was one of the most famous writers of his day and who writes about true crime, he had already alerted the public at the end of 1891 that, in fact, Jack the Ripper was probably a suicide and that he had been a young man, slightly built, with a fair moustache, but, but was himself a brunette, uh, that he was educated um, perhaps in the line of being a medical student, but he was not a graduate, he was not a doctor, and that he uh, showed a genius for evading uh, the police. But in the end, he felt some measure of remorse and has now taken his own life. When that column came out, because Sims seemed to be speculative, but we think he was talking about Druid, um, it, it gained no traction with the public. But once in 1898, the, 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 the paragraph appears in Major Griffith's book, now begins the era uh, into the Edwardian times of the, the rewriting of the entire story by people like Griffiths and particularly George Sims, which is, it wasn't protracted, it wasn't over two years, it was five victims, and the police knew this at the time, and they were closing in on the uh, chief suspect. It really, they're saying, it's not just a suspect, he was the murderer, but we have to be uh, careful in saying that because he is beyond the protection of due process. He can never have his day in court. And that this middle-aged surgeon, this English gentleman, he was very wealthy and a recluse, and his friends were very worried about him when the Ripper murders began because he had twice been in uh, mental institutions as a voluntary patient, these are private asylums, and in which he confessed that he wanted to savage um, women, fallen, so-called fallen women of the East End. And it's, um, uh, uh, it's terrible that he was, he was let out, according to this story. And so the friends went to the police to say, we think that this Jack the Ripper figure is actually our mentally deranged retired surgeon friend. And the police told them, we know that already, and we're on to him, and we're going to catch him. But when they next saw him, he was a corpse being dragged out of the River Thames. So to Edwardians, right through World War I, into the early 20s, the Jack the Ripper story was not a mystery because George Sims, the famous true crime writer with top police contacts, had informed them so. He, he had been identified. The name can't be released because that's inappropriate. But had he lived, he would have either been put in a mental institution for the rest of his life or he would have gone on trial and been convicted. It's only in the nine, late 1920s, early 1930s, that new generation of researchers are looking into it and they think, well, it can't be that hard to find out who this drowned doctor was. Um, so they search various records and they can't find that person. And so they assume it must be just a made up story, perhaps a bit of police propaganda to make them look better than they actually were. There is some truth in that, but their, their rejection of the story entirely um, it, it is one of the first mistakes of researchers in the 20th century. Um, by the time Montague Druitt's name is actually released to the public in 1965, um, it doesn't get any traction with the uh, public because they were so cemented on the view of Jack the Ripper. If he's a gentleman, he must be a doctor. And now it turns out he was a 
young lawyer. So this police chief um, who had named him, misnamed him as a doctor, and we've come full circle now back to me in that classroom with that astute student, um, they assumed that McNaughton doesn't know who he's talking about. And so the whole subject arguably went in the wrong direction from that point towards other police suspects or other quite outlandish uh, theories about hoax diaries and dodgy DNA and royal conspiracies that never happened. Um, but but it's all because the perception was the original suspect uh, appears to be someone shanghai into the mystery who was just a tragic suicide uh, by a police chief who, who, who is incompetent. And we have tried to restore the original solution. So, Jonathan, uh, so just kind of back up a little bit because uh, there's so much detail in both your books and uh, with Christine helping out with your first and also the second. So the the autumn of 1888 were the, at least the canonical five. Those, those unfortunates that were murdered in uh, Mary Jane Kelly was November 9th. And I think, was it, is it on the gravestone of uh, Druitt that says that his family said that he, he, he died, uh, what, December 4th or something, 1888? Yes. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so, but then your first book uh, has Case Southern, it says 1891. Um, is, what happened, how, what, what's the significance of 1891? Well, the, the breakthrough in this case was the discovery of a member of parliament, uh, not a member of the government, uh, but a member of the Tory party on the back bench, a member of the landed aristocracy called Henry Richard Farkerson. And he is at the beginning of 1891, he is telling sort of like his 10 best friends in London that somehow he, of all people, uh, a man who represents um, West Dorset, the west part of uh, southern England, he knows the identity of Jack the Ripper and that the man is long deceased and that he was the son of a surgeon and that he had some kind of illness, which he describes as homicidal mania, and that he... He committed suicide. He doesn't say how he committed suicide, but that, that, that his, his mania led him towards destroying himself. And he also, uh, by implication, c- claims the man confessed, not in word, but in deed, because on the night of the, the, the final murder of Mary Jane Kelly, um, this unnamed son of a surgeon was in such a terrible state that he took his own life, a confession in action. And we think that McNaughton, Melvin McNaughton, was brought into the case by the the link, the key link that Christine discovered a few years ago, and that is that he had a friend at the Home Office, the head of explosives, the bomb disposal expert, Colonel Civilian Magendi, and a very close friend of his, and a very close friend of the writer George Sims. They're like a trio. And Magendi had uh, had a relation who had married into the clan of the Druids, who were a very famous name because Montague's uncle, Dr. Robert Druid, uh, was deceased by 1888, 1891, but he was a very famous physician. And uh, we think that McNaughton was brought in by Magendi and the Magendi was perhaps brought in by a member of the Druid family to, to try and, because they, they, they were desperate that someone else not be sent to the gallows for um, their Montague's crimes. And that McNaughton at that moment, because he was up, unusually upper class for a police chief, he took control of the cover up, the family cover up, in order to protect his friend, Colonel Magendi, and also because. Montague can't be brought to trial and that he would run it from there on and make sure that no one would go to uh, prison or the gallows or into a mental institution for those particular five murders that the family told him that Montague had committed because Montague had confessed 
to his cousin, uh, the Reverend Charles Druitt, the son of that famous Dr. Robert Druitt, and who was married to Isabel Magendi Hill, the relation of Colonel Magendi, we believe that he had, Montague had confessed his crimes to the Reverend Charles, and that's how the family knew. Okay. okay. So then uh, McNaughton probably uh, discovered this around 1891, so then by 1894 with this memoranda, that's uh, what had he, he had already uh, had kind of gone through that by that time? Yes, and we think that he, he committed nothing to paper, McNaughton, because what he discovered was, was, that, was that somehow Montague Druitt had been brought to police attention in 1888 as perhaps suspect, even suspect is too strong a word. Uh, he was just someone who was um, uh, questioned in Whitechapel on, the, uh, on one night, perhaps the night of the double murder. His name was taken down amongst many names. It's also possible that he uh, was arrested and bluffed his way to freedom by using the shield of his class and his pedigree and uh, was probably released with an apology. Um, something like that happened and that McNaughton knew that this was the man the police dragnet was trying to close in on in 1888 and couldn't find him. And so he was also anxious to protect the reputation of Scotland Yard. And so he committed initially nothing to paper. And then in 1894, at the beginning, uh, the Sun newspaper has what they think is a major scoop. And that is there is a there is a high echelon police cover up of the identity of Jack the Ripper, who was really from a, a young man from a very good family. Now, that sounds like it's the Druitt solution about to spill out into the public sphere. But in fact, right. the Sun has the wrong family, the wrong police and the wrong um, a suspect, which was a man called Thomas, Thomas Cutbush, who was uh, guilty of assaulting but not killing women, um, and who was in Broadmoor, the, uh, the place, uh, the institution for the criminally insane. And <clears throat> McNaughton, we think, was worried that, uh, that Reverend Charles Druitt might be tempted to go public and say, it is not that man, it is someone I know. Because in this confession that we think that Montague gave him, there was a sort of a, a, a charge that he had to accept, which was I want the, Montague wanted the truth to come out within a decade, or some of the truth to come out within a decade. And so McNaughton, Magendi, and George Sims are always aware in those 10 years that they're kind of hostage to the whims and moods of this troublesome priest, the Reverend Charles Druitt, that at any point he could go to the public or, or, or write a letter to a newspaper. And so McNaughton decided that that might happen now with this non-scoop from the sun. And so he decided, I will commit Montague Druitt's name, MJ Druitt's name, to a police memorandum in which... Confidential, I, though. Sorry? It's confidential, though, wasn't it? Now, there are two versions. One is confidential, in which McNaughton very much says, well, Druitt is no better than two other suspects. Um, but his family believe him to be Jack the Ripper. And he says he was, with was on the line, sexually insane, which is a, a, a Victorian um, ex uh, a diagnostic expression long gone now which means a person who commits acts of violence in order to be erotically fulfilled. So in that memorandum that's confidential, that, that supposedly is supposed to go to the Home Office, but never does, it just sits in the Scotland Yard archive, McNaughton, on the one hand, says, well, Thomas Cutbush was not Jack the Ripper. In fact, we have three suspects who are better than him. And here are, the, here are three. And one of them is MJ Druitt, but he's saying, well, you know, not, not that we think that he's necessarily a very strong suspect, but he's stronger than Cutbush. But inside what he writes about MJ Druitt are quite extraordinary things about this uh, good family, respectable family, believing that this man who might or might not be a doctor was Jack the Ripper, because he was a man who enjoyed 
violence, uh, who gained uh, sexual satisfaction from violence. In other words, the family believe he's Jack the Ripper because he's Jack the Ripper. So it's a circular argument inside that little bit of his confidential memorandum. Now, the other memor- the other version he writes at the same time, that we think he was preparing to leak to the public through somebody like his friend George Sims. And that's where he says um, Montague Druitt is a middle-aged doctor um, who was suspected by his fairly good family. So that suggests maybe it's not the family of Dr. Robert Druitt. And uh, they, they allege that he was sexually insane. But McNaughton, in that version, he kind of swaps places with the family because he says, oh, but I, I really have little doubt that that man, Mem J. Druitt, uh, he was Jack the Ripper and the truth lies at the bottom of the Thames, which one interpretation of that could be his body floated to the surface, but not the knife that he used to kill those uh, five uh, defenceless women in Whitechapel and Spitalfields. So that version of his memorandum is created for public dissemination. How do we know that? Because it was publicly disseminated. In 1898, it's what he tells or shows Major Griffiths. Major Griffiths, uh, okay. Yeah, in his book, Mysteries of Police and Crime. And that's the origin of the beginning of Jack the Gentleman as the leading explanation for the Jack the Ripper murders. So, so um, uh, speaking of Major Griffiths, uh, 1889, or 1898, that, that was his book, right? Yes, December 1898. Right, and he was the inspector of prisons at, yes. uh, at that time, and a close friend of McNaughton. So you're you're thinking that uh, McNaughton uh, here is I'm going to take advantage of both Sims and Griffiths, and it seems to me that he told Griffiths quite a bit. That even Griffiths said that there were more than three suspects, but these are the three top of the line suspects. That and uh, uh, that's kind of a how he put that in his uh in his you know his writing right we take a a, a a somewhat different take on it we don't think major griffiths is a close friend of his okay. uh, because he because he never mentions him in his memoirs george sims is a close friend of his and we think sims knows exactly who montague drew it was and how they're running uh, a mixture of fact and fiction to the public uh, we, we believe this because of his column in 1891 that we've already mentioned, um, where he knows the true particulars of Druid. Um, with Major Griffiths, we think that perhaps Griffiths was rather sceptical of good old Mac at that moment, suddenly telling him that, oh, well, actually, there's a Home Office report. That's a lie. And uh, it's known at the Home Office that that that. Jack the Ripper was almost certainly uh, this doctor whom we were trying to arrest. And Griffiths was thinking, how come I don't know anything about that until this moment? And then he was shown this copy of the memorandum. Um, And so what he does is instead of putting such an extraordinary scoop in his book, in one of his chapters, he just shoves it into the introduction and in fact later in the book he 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 will say really the police still don't know who jack the ripper was and there may have been six murders and not five and so we think that he was left a a rather not troubled but just thought what are you doing mac are you doing your usual charm offensive to try and make scotland yard better i mean i'll i'll put it in but i'm going to bury it in the intro and as it was it didn't work because the press leapt upon that paragraph in okay. great astonishment. And it was a major scoop that, that, that went around all the newspapers going, who's the drowned doctor? Okay. So now, but Griffiths was also a friend of Anderson's, the assistant commissioner who was McNaughton's boss, who favored uh, com- uh, one of the other three suspects. Do you think that maybe Griffiths was kind of, you know, thinking, hey, I'm friends with Anderson. I like his idea as well. Um, <clears throat> Anderson had begun propagating the notion of a, a lunatic in asylum 
as almost certainly Jack the Ripper. We have to say almost certainly because he can never be brought to trial because he's been institutionalised. Um, from 1895 onwards, we... So we McNaughton might be the source for Anderson? <laughs> well, we propose the theory, based on the available evidence, that when McNaughton took charge of the Druitt uh, family cover-up, or as one source calls it, the family hushing it up, he decided that he could not trust his Scotland Yard colleagues with the, the, anything to do with Montague Druitt because he just feared it would leak, and uh, if it leaked in such a way that um, a, it, it was said to the public by some top police official that it was almost certainly this young lawyer who drowned himself in the Thames at the end of 1898. That, right. that alone would be enough to expose the Druitt family uh, to their neighbours and colleagues in their various respectable professions and, and, and destroy their reputations. So what McNaughton did was he created a suspect in Kosminski whom he knew was alive. And he told Anderson in 1895, we think, about Kosminski and said that he was, he was long dead and that he was a man who had, in effect, masturbated himself into a state of exhaustion and died. And, and, and the reason that he did that, I mean, it was true that, uh, that, that Aaron Kosminski was in an institution, but it was much later than 1888, 1889. It was in 1891. Right. But he right. was someone that the medical record shows was chronically um, playing with himself. And so he, he offers in 1895 this suspect to his boss, Anderson, whom he loathes, whom he detests, and Anderson hates McNaughton. So this, this part of the office politics is often never discussed in other right, right. Uh, books, and yet it's vital to understand that the two men don't like each other. And, and Swanson so, was a kind of a subordinate of Anderson. So whatever Anderson said, Swanson kind of followed. Yes, and, he, and what McNaughton did was he handed, he handed Anderson a suspect that McNaughton couldn't take responsibility for because he claimed that he'd been found in 1880. Eight, and that he was dead and that he was someone who was involved in masturbation. Now, he knew that Anderson was a Victorian prude par excellence and that he regarded masturbation, which in the Bible is called the sin of Onan, as quite evil and that if, you were, if a man was guilty of that, he was capable of murder, whereas McNaughton had a completely different background, having been an old Etonian, going to the boys' school. Um, he, he'd grown up with a much more worldly view of human sexuality, uh, even after Oscar Wilde was disgraced and jailed in a homosexual scandal, McNaughton continued to call his former neighbour a literary genius. Um, so he played Anderson. He played on Anderson's sexual prejudice. And Anderson at that moment said, that is the man who is Jack the Ripper. And he, he, went, and he went to his grave thinking that this is a man who had died in the asylum. In fact, Kosminski outlives Anderson. And we think that he did this with a number of suspects, McNaughton. He would tell everybody what they wanted to hear, including Little Child with Tumble Tea. He would say to them, yeah, your man is dead or your man committed suicide. But actually, only one of these men is deceased in a suicide, and it's Montague Druitt. The, uh, so, Christine, uh, I apologize, but Jonathan and I, when we get talking, we <laughs> stop. Okay, and then, uh, but I do have a question for both of you. One is, how is this book different from all the other Ripper related books? Uh, Christine's not going to get me to uh, answer that. Uh, I'm not butting in, I assure you. Um, so <laughs> right. The, the, the difference of our book is, we would argue, similar to the books you yourself have written on the prime suspect of 1888, Dr. Francis Tumblety. Uh, Christine, I like Jonathan. 
(laughs) (laughs) And, And that is, we are not claiming we've solved it. It can't be solved at this distance. What we are claiming is that a police chief of the day solved it and that this was a solution believed by that police chief, by a couple of clergymen, by the murderer's own family, uh, by a a couple of minor writers, uh, by a top writer, George Sims. They believed, rightly or wrongly, that Montague Druitt was Jack the Ripper and yet none of them wanted it to be him. The family didn't want it to be him. Uh, Sims and McNaughton don't want it to be him because that, that puts their friend Magendi in reputational danger. Um, but the evidence was so strong that the family presented to McNaughton posthumously. Like he only has to hear the story to say to them, you're right. You're right. It is your deceased member. And therefore we think that what they must have said to him was information about the murders known only to Scotland Yard and the murderer. And McNaughton thought, well, that's a slam dunk. It is him. Now we must begin uh, or continue the process of covering it up. And yet we're going to have to um, prevent any other person from, uh, from, from swinging from the gallows for the murders that were committed by Montague. So we don't claim we've solved anything. We claim we have rediscovered and restored this police this posthumous police solution just as your books which are excellent by the way restore the solution of the suspect that they uh, arrested and who fled to the jurisdiction jurisdictional safety of new york dr francis tumblety obviously we think that montague drew is the ripper not tumblety that's where we disagree but right. we feel our books are in the same kind of subgenre of so-called ripperology in that we're looking at solutions of the time and trying to assess why they thought what they did about those particular men. And one interesting thing uh, with both Druitt and also the suspect I do is there. They're actually slightly different than the, uh, let's say, the cookie cutter idea of a serial offender who lacks complete remorse. Because now, w- w- are you saying possibly that the Druitt, because he committed suicide, he had remorse? Or was this just something that he felt he should do and he really didn't lack remorse? We, th- we think that from the glimpses, we get that after he murdered Mary Jane Kelly and tore this poor woman's remains to pieces in that room that Montague Druitt had a breakdown and that he was bundled by his family eventually into an English asylum manor house at uh, Chiswick which is where he slipped away from and, 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 and drowned himself in the River Thames, which was right next to it. Um, but we also uh, put forward a circumstantial case that the family tried to put him in a very expensive asylum uh, near Paris and, and that this, the, this backfired. In these sources, there's constant reference to, to the English patient or to Jack the Ripper being in a raving and shrieking state. Um, He has to be heavily drugged. He's not compass, but that he then regains his lucidity and is able to appear uh, in court and win a major civil case. He's able to appear at his sporting club, possibly chaperoned by his brother, William. Um, And then he suffers uh, a, a, another breakdown perhaps and is put in the manor house asylum but now this is the thing right you asked did he commit suicide because he regretted what he did George Sims in that 1891 column uh, says that well he may have claimed remorse but really he had none it's just the histrionics of a very cunning and clever and sick murderer the family would believe that Montague suffered epileptic mania, which is another Victorian expression long gone now, which means someone who 
commits terrible acts whilst in the state of mental seizure and that they only vaguely remember what they've done and therefore they're not responsible for what they've done. And we can understand why the family uh, clung on to that uh, diagnosis or, or, or explanation. Uh, McNaughton does not claim that. He says he's a sexual maniac. He's someone who enjoys what he does. He enjoys the mayhem and that he knows what he's doing. So he commits suicide, we think, because that police dragnet was closing in on him after France and that the police were checking um, all private asylums, which is quite a thing to do because it's one thing to go into state institutions uh, and throw your weight around, but to go into private asylums where English people have placed their um, relatives who are mentally ill and they want that kept as quiet as possible because of the stigma of, of, uh, of mental impairment or insanity, and to have suddenly the plods turn up saying, we want to know who has just been admitted. Um, in a class stratified society, they would be loath to do that. But they, but they, according to these newspaper reports, they did do that. And according to George Sims, they're, they're closing in on the, the so-called mad doctor. And we think that's why, like other serial killers in history, Druitt killed himself because he was about to be uh, arrested. So basically that would have had to have happened in, let's say, November to early December 1888. And so they likely did not know the name of him yet. That's right. Uh, okay. Another thing, um, Mike, on the suicide of Druitt, it's often being questioned why he killed himself in Chiswick. And um, people in the past have looked at it and, and seen that his mother was to die in that same asylum, the Truth Asylum at Chiswick, a couple of years after. Um, the truth is that she was not in that asylum when he died um, in late 1888. She was only to go in there later. Um, 1890. Something I discovered was that... Um, the Druitt family were actually friends with the Doctor's Took of the Chiswick Asylum um, and okay. their sister Caroline Took who lived there with them. She was a deaconess in the Church of England and she was well known. She was a close friend of Charles and Isabel Druitt who were, um, Charles Druitt was Monty's cousin who we think um, Monty confessed to. So it's quite likely that... Um, they put him into that asylum because the family were known to the Took family and there was that um, discretion. And Monty may have learnt that the police were coming and just thought, my, my game's up, oh, there's no way I'm going to be arrested for these crimes. And the, where the asylum was is just sort of down the road from the River Thames. So he would have just come out of that asylum. It was a private asylum, so it wasn't a caged type of asylum. He could have walked out of there, just walked down the road and into the Thames. So that, that was something that we found was very interesting. Again, that family association with the Druitt family. So the, the suicide would have been after his confession um, to his, the, his, was it his relative, was it? His cousin, he, yeah, the Reverend his, his cousin. Yes. So the suicide would have happened right after that. And it's no, so... We, no, we that, think that he, he, he was in a uh, dysfunctional state after the murder of Mary Jane Kelly. Okay. And, that he got, and that he got himself to Kensington, where that wing of the Druitts lived. And that Charles Druitt may have been in London for family or clerical business. And he took his confession at that moment. William was brought in um, and, and William had already been making arrangements for him to be put in this French asylum, which we tentatively identify as the Van Vez, an asylum in Van Vez uh, run by Dr. Jules uh, Ferre. And we think that at that moment, They've heard his confession several times because he's babbling it over and over again and they have to heavily drug him and then they have to really bribe that asylum director. He'll say things that aren't true. He's insane. That's why he's here. Um, it's an extraordinary story 
because it matches the other sources that we found. That source, by the way, from the Philadelphia Times of 1889 wasn't found by us. Um, it was found by a, a brilliant researcher. You and I both know him well, Roger Palmer. Oh, yeah, Roger. Yeah, so he was kind enough to send that to us, and he's credited in the book with finding it. And the thing about that source, it has no names. Well, it, it can't because the, everyone's using false names. But but it has indications in it that it is Druitt, and it is William Druitt, his older brother, um, who is disguised as a friend in the story, who is a solicitor. Now, we see in Sims's writings that William Druitt is often so disguised as the friend of the mad doctor. And the other person who has escorted the English patient to France is described as a clergyman and the man's cousin. And the other person, the solicitor, the so-called friend, immediately jumps in and says he has no other relative. He says this to the French doctors. He has no other relative. Well, this is almost word for word the same as the... Um, account by the local newspaper in Chiswick of William Druitt's testimony uh, to the inquiry into the drowning of his brother Montague, in which he tells uh, the most whopping lie that that apart from myself and our mother, who has been uh, institutionalised due to a progressive mental disease, uh, the, the, we have no other relatives. And we think that this is, again, this ruse that he plays trying desperately to keep the walls of the media away, who would be thinking, even at that Chiswick uh, inquiry, the name Druitt. Is this a relative of the famous Dr. Robert Druitt? What a scoop this would be against Fleet Street if a, a relative of Dr. Druitt, of all people, has taken his own life in the Thames. But what he does, William, is he says, there's no other relative. It's just me and mum. And... Dr. Thomas Diplock accepts this without uh, demurral, and we think that's because, as Christine discovered, uh, what no one had ever discovered before, Diplock knew the Druids. He had already conducted, a couple of years before, exactly the same sort of uh, coronial inquiry into the suicide of a young man who was Isabella Druitt's nephew. Isabella Druitt is the mother of Reverend Charles Druitt, and she is the aunt of Montague and William Druitt. So Diplock is sitting there knowing exactly who William Druitt is and knows that he is the nephew of the famous Dr. Robert Druitt, but he just let it go because we protect the members of the upper bourgeoisie, the upper classes, uh, almost reflexively. Of course, what he didn't know was that William Druitt was also misleading him because he was... He knew about Montague's double life, and he certainly wasn't going to talk about that. Um, he appears to be honest to a fault in mentioning his mother's uh, mental illness and being in an asylum because that was such a, a public um, uh, scandal. Uh, and so he would appear at that moment to be, oh, he's very frank in what he's admitting. But that's a shield he's using because actually behind that, he is concealing all sorts of things. We don't even think Druitt was sacked um, from... Uh, the school, what we know is he was sacked from his uh, sporting club. And we think that's because William had informed them that, that my brother has gone abroad for uh, treatment in an asylum. And they and they knew that they couldn't expect a resignation letter from someone who was mentally impaired. They didn't want to put on the record that he was mentally impaired. So they just dismissed him, which seems like a cold and callous thing to do. But we argue was probably trying to protect Montague Druitt's reputation. So... Uh Sorry, you go ahead. I was just going to say because uh, we are limited on time, but like, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to tell. I just wanted to tell Christine something that I wrote a, a fiction novel called The Ripper's Hellbroth, and I have a character named Rupert Rhinelander. He's got an eye patch, and uh, he's from Australia, and he comes on this book tour movie thing. Comes to Rochester, New York, and we're excavating the body of Tumulty, and so we have a, a gentleman's bet going on. And so I wonder who that person was that uh, apparently he liked dry Chardonnay over beer, which really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to read that. I haven't read that one of yours. I'll have to pick that up and read it. <laughs> That's right. And now let's let's give the listeners a place where they can find you. Do you guys have a website or a favorite place you'd like people to come and search you out? 
We do have a website and a Facebook page. If you go to our website, it's called Hainsworth Ward Ages, all one word, dot com. And you'll see lots of information about the book and, and about us. And um, if you're interested, you can also buy the book via a link on that. And um, the book's published by Regnery History in the United States. So we're really thrilled that they um, also published the book and in the United Kingdom by Amberley Publishing. Is that available now? Yes, in okay. bookshops and online. Fantastic. So we'll have that link to our webpage as well. Again, um, it's been a great conversation. Uh, lots of information. Uh, the book we are talking about is The Escape of Jack the Ripper, and that's the truth about the cover-up and his flight from justice. And our guests have been the, who are the authors of the books, uh, Jonathan Haines, Hainsworth and Christine Ward Ages. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much for having us. Thank it's you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.